Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everybody. Happy Sunday, and welcome to this edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight, for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight, a a look at Christian persecution over the last 2,000 years shows us conditions are ripe for it to return in our day. Here in 2024, we have a tendency as Christians to view the bulk of religious persecution as being in the past, and it absolutely isn't. Not only that, conditions are ripening for it to return at the end of the church age, which is where we are right now. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, we read the following quote, It has been said that the lives of the early Christians consisted of persecution above the ground and prayer below the ground. How about you, Christian? Are you ready for the coming persecution? 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Peter writes, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Tonight we examine some of the persecution that was endured at the hands of the apostles, as well as some historical persecution endured by the church over the last 2,000 years. Make no mistake about it. The number one killer of Christians has always been, and will always be, Mother Rome. Pagan Rome did it nearly for the first 400 years of the church, with Papal Rome at the helm after that. Church history has returned to its starting place, And that tells you that things are getting ready to wind up. How the church came in is how she'll go up and out of here. It's a sobering thought, to say the least. On this episode, we look at the once and future persecution we look at the once and future persecution of the church that Jesus shed his blood to start. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up today. We thank you, God, for the food on the table, the clothes on our back, and the roof over our head. And we're so glad, we're so glad, Father God, that we have a Bible, that we have your King James Bible, and that we can open it up and we can read what you have for us. And uh, we invite you to meet with us tonight, God, as we always do, and lead us and guide us into all truth. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to see the chat room filling up and people logging on. Uh, This morning at Bethany Baptist Church, I preached a message on uh, the command of the Apostle Paul for us to follow him. And he's the only person outside of Jesus Christ, but certainly the only Apostle that directly commands us to follow him. 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And Philippians 3.17, Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for and in sample. And my message this morning for the Sunday service, and you can go uh, watch it on YouTube or you can go listen to it on Spreaker. Um, my message this morning was about the biblical call to committed Christianity from the Apostle Paul to each and every one of us who are alive here and now in the closing hours of the church age. 
and it was a sobering message to say the least. And when you have time, uh, go take a listen to it. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus says, um, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. And we are called to the sacrificial life. We are called to the servant life. Take a listen to what Corey Ten Boom said about that sacrificial life. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin. And there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Boom, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel officers, guards. In the concentration in concentration camp, and that man said, "I have I'm now a Christian. I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible, and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done, but then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness." And Fräulein Tambom, once in me forgiven, will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful text one of these boundless resources Romans 5 5 the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us and I said thank you Jesus that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me and thank you Father that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. And Corey Ten Boom, um, she, she went through a very, very hard time at the Ravensbrück concentration camp with her sister and the rest of her family was shipped off to Auschwitz and they had to pay a high price to follow the Apostle Paul as he follows Jesus Christ. And we live in a day and age where biblical Christianity is something that is mostly unknown to the church. And um, if you haven't heard my message Go listen to it when you get a chance, and um, I think it will be a blessing to you and a blessing for you. And tonight's Bible study, I want to look at persecution of the early church. I want to look at historical Christian persecution, and I want to look at the likelihood that it may come back around in the relatively near future. We are living in strange times. We are living in, uh, we are so far off the beaten path. We are so far off of the template. Um, And and, uh, each day brings new challenges and insights. And tomorrow on the podcast, Lord willing, we're going to show you about the dark demonic agenda of Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz and the Democratic Party. And uh, I don't want to go into it here tonight, but noon Eastern time tomorrow, Lord willing, uh, we are going to do a podcast that is going to show you what the Democrats have in mind. And it is absolutely a very, very dark vision of the future. And in that dark vision, that's where Christian persecution is likely to arise. And we'll cover all that and more on the podcast tomorrow at noon Eastern time. 
Uh, we're so glad that you're here tonight, that you have decided uh, to join us for yet another Bible study here at Now the End Begins. It's a blessing for us. We hope it's a blessing for you. And um, let's play some music and let's get our hearts and minds uh, towards worship and study of the Word. O oh, daughters of Zion, O oh, Abraham's sons, hear the words of your father, hear his promise of love. I will make you a blessing, so count the stars if you can. You will be a great nation I will give you this land I will bring you back home I'll bring you back home, oh my children You will no longer roam Lost and alone in the night There is nothing on earth that could take you away Once I gather you under my wings I will bring you all back home again Though you've wandered like strangers To the ends of the earth I will send you a savior finish my work you have no other shepherd you have no other lord green pastures are waiting in zion once more
If you're just tuning in, tonight's topic for our Bible study is a look at Christian persecution over the last 2,000 years that shows us conditions are ripe for it to return in our day. And we're going to be looking at biblical persecution, some historical uh, and secular accounts of persecution of the Christian church. We're going to read some excerpts from Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I trust that tonight's program will be a blessing to you and for you. At the bottom of the hour, in just about eight minutes, we're going to go into our time of prayer and praise. If you have a prayer request or a praise report, post it in the chat room, and we'll be happy to add it to the list.
preacher got up and said, Stand to your feet. We'll start with a prayer. If you have a need, let it be heard, saints, let it be known. We're all family and you're not alone. But that's when he saw her in the back of the church. Her silence and sadness cried out the hurt. The kind shepherd knew just what to say. I need to know before we pray. An unspoken request. Does anybody have one here tonight? Did you come with a burden you can't share? A need in your life. Just lift up your hand to the one who can give you rest. Child, have no fear. Our God can hear an unspoken request. Well, the preacher whispered as she raised her hand, Sweet Holy Spirit, come by her and stand. When her tears started flowing, he had no doubt that in the throne room of heaven, her secret was out. An unspoken request. Does anybody have one here tonight? Did you come with a burden you can't share? A need in your life. Just lift up your hand to the one who can give you rest. Child, have no fear. Our God can hear. An unspoken request Child, have no fear Our God can hear An unspoken request Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and we pray for lost souls. We pray for Sarah and Eric and Becky Jacobs, Greg and Melissa Price. Jessica Trent says, please pray for my husband, Jesse, for salvation and my brother and sister-in-law, Patrick and Katie, to get saved. Kimberly McClintock, please pray for the salvation of my two adult daughters, E and J. Shayla Clark's husband, Glenn. In Jeanette's family, Cheyenne, Bridget, Tony, Dion, Matthew, Samuel, and two great grandbabies, uh, Trista, Tara, Ted, Shauna, and George, Trevor, Derek, Adam, and Roland Carrier and their families, my three brothers, John, Jimmy, and David, daughter Christy, niece Melissa, and sister in law Dale, Jesse and his mom, Rachel's dad, Ralph. Unsaved Catholic family members of the Bolton family, Jordan Shapiro, David Peck, Susan Weir's Bicky's daughters, Valerie and Marie, husband Greg Sr. and son Greg Jr., Jeffrey's children, Tyler, Tevin, daughter-in-law Caitlin, and grandsons Logan, Ronnie, and Russell. Jeanette and Bob have unsaved Catholic family members. Connie has three unsaved kids, Brandy, unsaved family. Rita in Colorado asking prayer for her son, Dan. Ron needs to get saved. Spray of Sunshine's kids, Daniel, Patrick, and Brian. Shannon praying for Lori W. and Brian M. Jan Lacker's son, David. Bonnie, please pray for my five children, 17 grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren. Barbara praying for Robert, Naomi, Blake, Alex, Ethan, Raquel, Janet, and Shandell. Nicole Zimmer, please pray for my best friend and family, the Meads and the Cooks. 
Cheyenne is praying for Barry K., Terry C., Alan G., Melody, Nick Beth, Ethan, and Haley. Karen's children, Jason and Tiffany, and grandchildren, Summer, Austin, and Emmett. Barbara's son, Jody. Mark Sherlock, praying for Savannah and her mom, Stephanie. Werner Bukes, for Bob and Abby. Junie and her dad, Kathy Hughes' son. Haley is praying for Zane. Lulu, unsaved family members. Miles and his family need to get saved. Many unsaved members in the Giacomino family. Dawn D. praying for David. Paul Caulfield for his brother-in-law, Frank. Ramona Hayes is praying for her daughter, Kimberly, to get saved and sober. And also for the, her grandchildren, William, Jason, David, and Amanda and their families for salvation. Patrick is praying for Jack and Aaron, Chelsea P., praying for her ex-husband, his parents, his sister, and her husband. Adam's wife, Shana, Lori B., Shira McPherson, for her children, Scott, Sherry, and Nicole, Lori Ann's grandfather, Irvin, Mark Fennell, Kevin Thompson, for his father, Tim, Steve Graves, Elga, Rob is praying for his three kids, Max, Olivia, and Mikey, Phyllis T., for her husband, Brian A. Robbins, he needs to get saved. Todd Broom's brother, Thad. Marie's friends, family, Ashley Dayton, Alyssa Kyle, Brandon, Grace, Micah, and Macy. Adam and Katie for parents, sisters, and other family members. Joe Rusiello for his mom, sister, and granddaughter. Ellen praying for her grandsons, Braden and Logan. His Grace is praying for Rob, Summer, Sue and Mike, Carl, Jason and Rachel, and Jason and Carrie. Lola's son, William, and wife, Lindsay, Hannah's mom, Anja. Praying for Hanu, John, Charles, and Anna Lilsa. Dave Evans for his friend, Taylor, Viviana, for her brother, Javier Reyes. Adam and Katie for their neighbors, Jason, Eddie, and Brian. Loretta Oates for her sons, Kenny and Matthew. Jane for her son, Troy. Julie Lynn for her friend Katie Ann. Chona for Estefano Jr., Eugenia, and her kids. Maricel and Cherry and her siblings, Julia and Maria Tricia. Chuck Edgerton for his son Jacob and mom, Lynette. Samantha is praying for Beth. Deborah Hare for her unsaved family members. Rita, she has unsaved family members. Teresa, Lisa, Annabal, Deborah Milton, Hap Nightingale. They all have unsaved family members. Don Huff, Claire and Virginia, Norman Merkel, Henrique Larson, Roz, Marisol Barcina, Shirley Medor, Eric Brian Huey. They all have unsaved family members. Don Huff, Claire and Virginia, Tony the Carpenter and his son Cole. Kenny B., unsaved family. Rachel K., Sandra C., Marky Mark, Regina Danner, Carol, Rachel Adams, they all have unsaved family members. Stacy is praying for her husband to get saved. Regina Danner for Kellyanne, Richard Wayne, and Sandra. The Muto family, Steph is praying for Michael. Terry for her family, Xavier for his mom, Reyes. Wife, Salma, and daughters, Clara and Lulu. Maria Silver for her Jehovah's Witness family in Venezuela. Tiffany Brown for her mother-in-law. The LaPiana family for extended family members. Uh, Dave Evans for his friend, Diana. Sue Duchesne's son, Norman, CJ's mom. Shira Shine for Kevin, Michelle, and Lewis. Loretta Watsney's husband and children need to be saved. Rebecca Lynn for Joel Smith. Shirley, uh, please pray for Marie, Haley, Patricia, Jaden, Richard, Patricia S., Joshua, Ruby, Gerald, Josiah, Moniz, and her husband, Hamid. Mary Ann Ellie's children, John and Marie and Christine, and grandkids, Sophia, Jacob, David, and Katrina. Tracy and Ralph Wallace for son-in-law, Ethan. Daughter, Shanna, grandson, Caden. In the Peck family. 
children Heather and Damien, husband David, and in-laws Barb and Jack. Jose De La Rosa's mom Alicia, Teresa M's sons James, Frank, and Peter, Terry Ewing's daughter Bryn, Steph for her brother Michael, Cassandra uh, for her husband Todd, and for sons uh, Nathan, Andrew, and Sonny. Zuzana needs to get saved. Marie Sim for her ex-husband, who is a Mason, and children John and Tracy and their family. Jean-Paul Mesa for his Catholic mom. Deborah Mack for John and Brenda. Zach Jefferson's mom and uncle, Katrina. Chelsea P. for Mike T. Mia in Texas for children, Kimberly, Danielle, and AJ. Holly, please add my husband Nick to the list, Rob's friend Eddie, Deborah Mack's friend Brandy, Char for her mom and extended family, Linda for Richard Kitzmiller, Heather W. for daughter Sophia, um, Carly Hamill for extended Catholic family all over the place, Andrew Moffat for her 22-year-old son Matthew, Brooke for her best friend Courtney and husband James. Veronica Corrick for her younger son Gustav. Deborah Mack for her sister-in-law Lisa and Lisa's children Kane and Dale. Soda Man for his brother-in-law Paul. Rob Beatty's neighbor. TJ. Sheelin says, please pray for my children Chelsea, Tori, Chris, and Lee. Salvation for Stephanie and protection over her children's hearts. Um, Blakely, Harper, and Addie. Finally, Christy Ireland. Please add my sister Ashley, her husband David, their children Gabriella, Stephen, and Samuel to the list. Also my sister Chelsea and her fiancé Kyle. And I believe that that salvation list is as large as it has ever been. And every single name on that list is as important as every other name. People who need a healing today. Pastor James Knox, prostate cancer. Um, M. Nance, please pray for my wife with heart failure. Nihal Pereira, his wife Shandrika has stage four cancer. Lulu's friend, um, Lulu's sister's friend Charlene has liver cancer and needs to get saved. Shira Shine says Joshua Blake is having his brain tumor removed on the 21st. That's in three days. Please pray. Sandy, please pray for problems with blood flow to my shoulders. Laurent, please pray for my nicotine addiction and mental health. Alicia, mental health. Jen, for God to lift my grief and replace it with his strength, salvation for my family, and reconciliation with my daughter. Heather has Lyme disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Amanda Ward continues to battle cervical cancer. Uh, Amber, complete healing and peace and sobriety. Angela, please pray for sister-in-law Gail with stage 4 kidney disease on dialysis and for my brother Larry to get saved. Linda's sister Marianne has rheumatoid arthritis. Asher, please pray for my mom. Stephanie, please pray for my husband Andy's battle with alcohol and for him to get saved. Krista is battling breast cancer. Amanda Emaw, breast cancer. Michelle Christian, bone cancer. Anetta needs a complete healing after having a stroke. George H. for health issues. James Rivette, recovering from addiction and mental health issues, looking for work. Robert Wiley is battling ALS disease. Please pray for God's protective and providential hand on him and his wife, Lisa. Jill Puckett, losing her vision. Ron Alliston has cancer. Brooke Kettlecamp, battling autism. Dan Kane's wife, Roxy, needs prayer. She has MS. And... Uh, his son, Jonathan, needs prayer as well. Rob's friend, Mike, has MS. Ro um, Roz has asthma and scoliosis. Maddie Luck has Lulibati dementia. And daughter, Michelle, has 
neuropathy, and fibromyalgia. Melissa B.'s husband, Brian, has stage 3 kidney disease. Ricky Gouda, prayer for her eyesight. Um, Jane, please pray for the salvation of my parents and my brother, and for my husband to have a healing. Dave Evans' friend, Manuela, has vasculitis. Casey, please keep my husband on the list. He is unsaved and a severe alcoholic. Kathy Heald, recovering from surgery. Husband Robert and Aunt Linda have macular degeneration, as does um, Teresa G. Wayne needs uh, needs prayer for cancer and salvation. Linda Benjamin, prayer for overall health and for memory problems. Berta and Mike Crabb are having health issues, and we continue to pray for them as well. Also, Kevin, uh, his dad has been going through some challenges at the ER this weekend, and I told him that we would put him on the prayer list for tonight. Um, He says, my father lives in St. Petersburg. He had a fall last week, ended up in the hospital. Lord willing, he'll be moved to a rehab facility Monday to start rehab, lots of painful work. He says, we are trusting God, and God is so good. And uh, Kevin, very, very glad that we are praying for his dad's health. Ladies who are expecting. Tanya, her son Vincent and fiance Sarah had twin boys on August 14th. And we rejoice with Tanya and the entire Albanese family. CJ, uh, daughter-in-law Emily, expecting in December. Deborah Max, friend Gwen, is about three months pregnant. Lauren, expecting a baby in December. And Lola W.'s daughter-in-law, Lindsay White, is expecting in March of 2025. Mark Saxo would like prayer for his son Joseph to return to the Lord. Uh, Martha... Please pray that God will help me get a car. John Walker and his wife want prayer for their gospel tract distribution efforts. Deborah Mack for Devin Miller. Lost Lake Last, please pray for my son Tristan. And Linda Lapiana, please pray for my kids Stephen, Danielle, and Christopher to return to the Lord. People with an unspoken. Dave M., Jan Lacker, Jeanette. Derek O'Reilly, Adrian Breda, Debbie Matthias, Julius, Dave Evans, Ricky Gouda, Jennifer, Carol from Georgia, Ron M., Bonnie, Marie Comfort, Rob, Steph, Marie C., Angela, Brooke, Lulu, Linda Pippin, Andrew, Lorianne, Blaine. Um, also, please pray for our children. Lorianne and I are asking prayer for all of our children, the Lord knows the need. Uh, Lola W., I have an unspoken. Please remember our free Bible and gospel track program. I have an update at the top of the hour on that. Also, our overseas pastors in the Philippines, pastors John Reed, Danny, and Arnell. In Vietnam, Pastor Fojon. In India, Pastor David Mark. In the UK, Stephen McCarroll. In Uganda, Erad Bairu Mumishu. In Spain, Xavier. And uh, we had been praying for Pastor Joel Tillis and um, the Suncoast Baptist Church Mission to Honduras. And they just got back on Tuesday. We went to church with them on Wednesday. Uh, he sends his love and um, very, very glad and grateful that we have been praying for his trip these past couple of months, and he is looking forward to seeing everybody at the mini camp meeting that's going to be taking place September 13th, 14th, and 15th. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for praying for uh, Pastor Joel and the Suncoast Baptist Mission to Honduras. Please pray for Ted Horton, From Prison Ministries International needs the Lord to open the door to getting out more Bibles. Please remember our NTEB street preachers. In New York City, Brian Kelly. 
in Baton Rouge, Kyle and Reagan in Philadelphia, Street Preacher Marie. Mike Abram is a trucker who leaves Bibles at truck stops. Jay is a street preacher in New York City to the LGBT. Joe Rusiello in Eagle Pass, Texas. Joshua Gaskins has a gospel tract ministry in Virginia. Aaron and Teresa McMahon of CPR Missions in Tennessee. Chaplain Steve Harrington of, in, uh, of, of the Ader County Jail in Stillwell, Oklahoma. And Brother Roy Bell from Las Vegas, Nevada. Up in Canada, Adrian P. Breda, Werner Bukes. South Africa, Arthur Uwes. And in Australia, we have Henry Biggs and Jennifer Thompson. Let's go to the chat room and see what we have live. Um, well, here's more of an extended uh, prayer request from Kevin. Please pray for his dad, Mickey, who broke his hip on Thursday. He's 83 and weighs about 125 pounds. He is six foot one and he had emergency hip replacement surgery. And uh, Kevin is going to be staying there with his dad. Uh, so please pray for Kevin, Carol, and Mickey to have a full healing after having emergency hip replacement surgery. Regina Danner, God has truly blessed me. Kidney doctor says, I am slowly reversing my stage three kidney disease and, co and, and can go to stage two. Amen. That's a praise report. Uh, Kimmy D. I think I read that Iran had an earthquake after Hamas attacked. Please pray for the hundreds of Muslims who are converted to Christianity. Um, amen to that. Jeanette, my, care, my caregiver George is quitting. And please pray for a new caregiver, and please pray for George to get saved. Kenny B., please pray for Tammy, who is a Catholic, for her eyes to be open and for her to be saved. Regina Danner has an unspoken, multiple unspokens, as does Shar and Terry. M. Campbell, please pray for God to renew my strength, and Shira... Um, also wants prayers for Joshua Blake's salvation. And I mentioned earlier that he's having brain surgery on the 21st. Heavenly Father, for all of these prayers and for the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we ask you to work and move as only you can. God, we're glad and we're grateful we know that when we pray, because we're your children, that you hear us, and we know that you answer our prayers. And Lord, we commit every name on this list, the ones for salvation, for restoration, for reconciliation, for healing, people battling diseases and illnesses and injuries. Lord, we just ask you to work and move and order and reorder the steps of every one of these prayers and the prayers and the people and work it all out, God, for your glory, for our good. And uh, we just commit all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One or two more quick songs. And when we come back, I'm going to have an update on the free Bible program. And we're going to get right into tonight's Bible study on 2,000 years of Christian persecution. And uh, it's going to be an eye-opener, but it's also going to be a blessing for you. And uh, we'll be right back after this. Troubles seem to swell 
And when I've reached the end of me, and my faith is getting dim, oh, I hear a sweet voice whisper, just bring it all to him. So I'll just bring it all to him when no one understands when you're looking for an answer. God always has a plan. can bring it all to him. In the throne room of my Savior, I'll find sweet relief. I'll find strength to bear my burdens. I'll find comfort for my grief. And when my cup is overflowing, back for the start of tonight's Bible study on biblical and historical Christian persecution. But before we get started, I want to give you a quick update on the NTEB Free Bible and Gospel Track program. And I just want to give you a little bit of a reminder as to why this program is so very, very important. We got a letter in the mail the other day, and it says this, Dear NTEB Ministry, could you please send me a free King James Bible reference study Bible, if possible, in large print? I am a 50-year-old and in a rehab and desperately need God's Word. Please pray for me for my healing from a very bad lifestyle of drugs and alcohol and need healing for my mind and body and heart. I need a closer walk with Jesus. I went astray for a while, but God never left me. Praise God. And then they gave us the, ad, the name and address of where that they would like the Bible sent to. And they close with, thank you so very much, God bless you all. And we talk about Bibles behind bars more than we talk about the Free Bible Program. But the Free Bible Program is a pinpoint precise outreach to people who desperately need a good study Bible, but they can't afford one. And in this case, this person is in a rehab right now, and he is marked with the scars of the battles that he's been through, and what a blessing it is that he can reach out to the NTEB Free Bible and Gospel Track program, and we can send him a Ruckman Reference Study Bible, 
and no strings attached. We'll send it right to his rehab. We send out thousands of these Ruckman reference study Bibles to thousands of individuals who need them. So when you donate to our free Bible program and Bibles Behind Bars, these are the type of people that you're helping. I could do an entire hour-long program every single month with all the dozens and dozens of individuals just like this guy who really need to have a good study Bible. Um, so uh, if you think that's a good thing to support, please continue to pray for this outreach. Um, go to nowtheendbegins.com or biblesbehindbars.com and click on the donate button and help us and help us to continue to do this work to give people like the man who wrote this letter a very desperately needed and much appreciated copy of God's Word. And we are able to continue to do this. We've been doing the free Bible program since 2018, and we have gone past 350,000 King James Bibles, New Testament scripture portions, and gospel tracts. And it's only possible with your prayers and your ongoing financial support. Please go to nowtheendbegins.com or biblesbehindbars.com and click on the donate button and help us out. We so very, very much appreciate that. All right, let's get right into um, tonight's Bible study. We're going to look at biblical Christian persecution. So we're not going to look at persecution in the Old Testament. We are going to, conv to confine ourselves to looking at persecution in the New Testament. So let's just run a couple of references. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Chapter... Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And here you have in Matthew chapter 5 a teaching on the kingdom of heaven and Jesus telling his disciples that they can fully expect persecution to come for them just the same way that it came to the prophets in the Old Testament. Let's do another one. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and let's look at verses um, 18 through 20. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. And here's the warning. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And... In my message this morning, I talked about the biblical call from the Apostle Paul for us to follow him as he follows the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I wrote. You're not going to be like Christ without following Christ. It just can't be done. And if you do decide to follow Jesus Christ as Paul commands us to, then you will absolutely have your very own Judas, 
your very own Pilate's judgment hall and your own Gethsemane. You will feel the wrath of the crowd who once claimed to be your friends. Jesus has a cross reserved for you. And if you follow him, you will get that cross. And that is very, very true. Acts chapter 7. Turn to Acts chapter 7. And uh, let's look at this excerpt from the very from the first and last sermon of the martyr Stephen. Acts 7, 51 through 53. Stephen says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, but and have not kept it. And that's uh, the martyr Stephen talking about persecution of the Old Testament prophets. Um, Acts chapter 22. Turn to Acts chapter 22. And let's read verses 1 through 5. Acts 22, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue unto them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye are all this day. And Paul says, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women as also the high priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So here you have kind of a, a look at persecution from the persecutor's perspective. And Paul says that... He was taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and he persecuted Christians unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. And then he says in verse 5, As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus, to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And uh, if you're just tuning in, we're looking at biblical Christian persecution. And the early church was filled with it. Their cup was filled to overflowing. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And it was interesting, after Saul got saved on the road to Damascus, he got a name change in Acts chapter 13, and Saul became Paul. Then Paul wound up on the receiving end of the persecution. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 11 through... 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, 
being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. And Paul says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, everybody was a Bible teacher, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And then he says in verse 16, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now, what was Paul inviting them to follow him to? Well, we just read it. Paul was inviting the Corinthians to join him in being hungry and thirsty and naked and buffeted and homeless and hardworking, people who are reviled but bless, people who are persecuted but take it, be people who are defamed but then they entreat to God for the salvation of the person who defamed them. And Paul says that we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. So make no mistake about it. When Paul says, follow me, that's what he's talking about. He is telling them to follow him in this Christian life that he is now living. Um, turn to... Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Look at what Jesus says in verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus is talking about discipleship. Now here in Matthew chapter 16, he is talking about the soon coming kingdom of heaven even though in Acts chapter 7 it would get put on hold for about 2,000 years. But here in Matthew chapter 16, he is giving them a biblical principle of discipleship, what it means to be a Christian. And he says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said. That's exactly how the Apostle Paul lived. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verses 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And then he says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Do you know that the Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh? I want to show you what the Apostle Paul had to live with. He said that we bear in our bodies the marks 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, <clears throat> in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Do you remember during the pandemic about four years ago, when the government in some states started to close the churches, and everybody freaked out, nobody knew what to do, and everybody's talking about civil war and all these different things, and it kind of made me think that if the apostles who endured legitimate persecution in the first century, could look down from heaven and watch how out of joint the entire church got during the pandemic. I think they would have laughed at us. They would have looked at the very silly things that we were doing, and they would say to themselves, you people know nothing about real persecution. And, and the truth is, we don't. We think that when the price of gas gets close to $4 or the cost of groceries gets too high, we think it's the Great Tribulation. Um, and it's not. It's absolutely not. Uh Jen has a question. What does Paul mean by necessities? Um, let's go back to that verse and find that word. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul says this in another place, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Um, let me give you one more verse. Um, turn to Oh, where is that verse? Give me just one. So, uh, yeah, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. And then one more. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, Paul says this in verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So the question is, what does Paul mean by necessities? Well, he was very aware and focused on finishing the work 
that God had called him to do. Paul calls this his course. And as he began to walk down the paths of what a dedicated, separated, biblical Christian life was all about, he, over time, began to get hyper-focused. And he was so intent on finishing the work that God gave him to do that he could say things like, he takes pleasure in infirmities and he rejoices in persecution. What type of person would think like that? Somebody who is completely sold out for the cause of Christ? Somebody who had already, though they yet lived, had already laid down their life for the cause of Christ. Let me give you a couple of quotes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Germanicus, a young man but a true Christian, being delivered to the wild beasts on account of his faith, behaved with such astonishing courage that several pagans became converts to Christianity and a faith which inspired such fortitude. Here's another one. I maintain no doctrines of my own. What I preach are the doctrines of Christ. And for those I will forfeit my blood and even think myself happy to suffer for the sake of my Redeemer. Uh, let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. Parsons pulled the straw near to him and then said to the spectators, This is God's armor. Talking about the straw that was about to be set on fire that would burn him at the stake. This is God's armor, he said. And now I am a Christian soldier prepared for battle. I look for no mercy, but through the merits of Christ. If you have never read Fox's Book of Martyrs or Martyr's Mirror, we have a bundle. And I've been kind of promoting this bundle lately. But we have a, a bundle of five books that we have put together that cover the topic of Christian persecution. And those five books are Through the Gates of Splendor, In His Steps, The Hiding Place, The Pilgrim's Progress, and Fox's Book of Martyr. And if you buy all five, we give you 10% off. If you don't have all five of these books, you need to get them. You need to read them. They will inspire you. They will challenge you. And especially uh, The Hiding Place in Fox's Book of Martyrs and Through the Gates of Splendor. Those are all true stories about people who laid down their life for the cause of Christ. You know what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews? I think it's chapter 11. Turn to Hebrews 11. Nope, I think it's 12. Yeah, here it is. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Paul says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. But you know what? 
the church did go through that. And the early church was bathed in the shed blood of the martyrs, uh, the Christian martyrs, the disciples and the apostles. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Let me show you some persecution of a couple of the apostles, and this is how they dealt with it. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. You know what you have in these three short verses? You have Peter, James, and John being beaten because they won't stop telling people about Jesus Christ, being brought before the council, and then they let them go and said, don't teach in his name anymore. And they didn't try to overthrow the government. They didn't stage a uprising. They didn't call for a civil war. But what they did do Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Corey Ten Boom and the Ten Boom family. God put on their heart to use their home to hide Jews and to use this very large space that God had given them as a portal to get Jewish people out of Holland and into safety. They didn't lose a single person. Every single Jew that came into their house made it safely to a foreign country. You know who didn't make it out? Every member of the Ten Boom family, with the exception of Corey. In order to do what God had called them to do and to protect the Jews and to protect those babies and children, they didn't lose a single one. But it cost the life of every single member of the Ten Boom family with the exception of Corey. And so, when we look at these passages and we see Paul using words like necessities, he is talking about the fact that he is not just simply following the Lord Jesus Christ. He is all in with both feet, both hands, his body, and his head. And he's not really concerned about what's going to happen to him. And so when the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, are you starting to see what he's really telling you? Are you starting to see what he's really trying to prepare you for? Now, you might say, well, I'm a Christian, and none of those bad things happen to me. But are you the type of Christian that the Apostle Paul is? Are you doing some of the things, any of the things, that he is telling you that a Christian should do and would do in times of persecution? Are you willing and able to give up everything you have, everything you own, to give up your family, your friends, your reputation, your money, your home, your standing, your position? Would you give it all up for the cause of Christ? Well, that's a question you should think about. 
Because when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, that's exactly what he's talking about. Here's another quote from Fox's Book of Martyrs. I fear neither death nor fire, being prepared for both. It has been said that the lives of early Christians consisted of persecution above the ground and prayer below the ground. I'll give you one more. Let me see a good one here. Those who were taken experienced the most cruel tortures the infernal imaginations could ever invent and by their constancy evinced that a real Christian can surmount every difficulty and despise ever danger to acquire a crown of martyrdom. That's something that people don't talk much about in our day. A crown of martyrdom. Well, it's right there in the book of Revelation. Have you ever looked at it? The Bible says this about the crown of martyrdom. Revelation 2.10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We call that the martyr's crown. You know how you get the martyr's crown? When you follow the Apostle Paul as he followed Jesus Christ. Paul got the martyr's crown. All the apostles got the martyr's crown except for the Apostle John. But he, he's probably going to get that crown because even though that they couldn't kill him, he gave himself up willingly God just supernaturally preserved him. When we come back, we're going to take a little trip into uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, and we're going to look at some historical persecution that took place outside the time of the Bible. We'll be right back after this.
Amen, and we are back for the last half hour of tonight's Bible study where we have been looking at Christian persecution. And for the first half hour, we looked at Christian persecution from a biblical perspective, uh, and now we're going to look at it outside of the Bible. And um, I have been quoting most of the Bible study from a book called um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it's an old book, a couple hundred years old. And if you've never read that book, you need to get a copy. You can go to BibleBeliever.com. That's the web address for our bookstore. And we have lots of the old classic books like that. We have um, The Hiding Place. We have... Uh, the Pilgrim's Progress, we have Fox's Book of Martyrs, we have Martyr's Mirror, Through the Gates of Splendor. Um, we have a lot of different books that will really help you uh, to get a handle on what Paul means when he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And if you haven't checked out our bookstore, um, you can come see us in person at 209 North 4th Street in Palatka, Florida. Or you can shop online at www.biblebeliever.com. And let me just give you a quick reminder, in just about three and a half weeks, we are going to have our big mini-camp meeting weekend, the 13th, 14th, and 15th of September. And um, if you think that you would like to come out and Join us in our mini camp meeting that is going to include the grand opening of the bookstore. And uh, Dr. Bill Grady is going to be there. David Daniels from Chick Publications is going to be there. Joel Tillis and the entire Soul Trap team uh, from Suncoast Baptist Church, they're going to be there. And it's just going to be a really good weekend. And uh, if you'd like to join us, you are invited. Just send us an email to info at nowtheendbegins.com and let us know that you have an interest in coming. That is September 13th, 14th, and 15th for the mini camp meeting weekend at Bethany Baptist Church and for the grand opening of the new Bible Believers Bookstore in Palatka. And if you haven't been following the updates, the store is coming along so wonderfully, so beautifully, um, and it's really turning into something very unique and very, very special. And you really have to see it for yourself. You have to come visit us, and uh, you'll be so glad that you did. And um, it is just the perfect Christian bookstore, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, I am partial towards our bookstore. Um, but that is September 13th, 14th, and 15th. Come on out and join us for our mini camp meeting weekend. And I promise you that it will be a blessing to you. All right, I want to read a little bit of an excerpt for you from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And this is an excerpt that has to do with Bishop Ridley and Bishop Latimer. And this talks about what they went through. Mr. Latimer, after remaining a long time in the tower, was transported to Oxford with Cranmer and Ridley. The disputations at which place have already been mentioned in a former part of this work, he remained imprisoned till October, and the principal objects of his prayer were three. So, Mr. Latimer had a threefold prayer that he prayed to the Lord after he got put in prison during the Spanish Inquisition, that he might stand faithful to the doctrine that he had professed. Number two, that God would restore his gospel to England once again. And number three, to preserve Lady Elizabeth to be queen. 
And all three of those things happened. And this is what he said uh, when he stood at the stake outside of the Bacardo Gate in Oxford with Dr. Ridley, and the fire was set to the pile of sticks. He raised his eyes toward heaven and said, quote, God is faithful who doth not suffer us to be tempted above our strength, end quote. His body was forcibly penetrated by the fire, and the blood flowed abundantly from his heart, as if to verify his constant desire that his heart's blood might be shed in the defense of the gospel. And this took place around 1555. So about 60 or so years before the King James Bible was published, you had people like Ridley and Latimer and Cranmer who were willingly going to their deaths to stay faithful to the cause of Christ. Let me give you another one. Um... Dr. Ridley being unclothed to his shirt, the smith placed an iron chain about their waists, and Dr. Ridley bid him fasten it securely. His brother, having tied a bag of gunpowder about his neck, gave some also to Mr. Latimer. Dr. Ridley then requested of Lord Williams to advocate with the queen the cause of some poor men to whom he had when bishop granted leases, but which the present bishop refused to confirm. A lighted stick was now laid at Dr. Ridley's feet, which caused Mr. Latimer to say, quote, Be of good cheer, Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. End quote. When Dr. Ridley saw the flame approaching him, he exclaimed, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. And he shouted till he died, Lord, received my spirit. And so these are just some of the ways that people were tortured and executed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, does the church in 2024 bear any resemblance to these people, Ridley, Cranmer, Latimer, willingly going to their death for the cause of the Bible? You know, we take it for granted you can go into any dime store and you can get yourself a cheap copy of the Bible. You, you can go into any bookstore and get a copy of the Bible. Most of us have three, four, five, six copies of the Bible. And you know what we don't hardly ever think about? And this point was brought home dramatically to me about three years ago. If you remember, about three years ago, we had a, um, a King James Bible night at the bookstore, and a man by the name of Mike Whalen uh, stopped by, and he gave a wonderful presentation on the King James Bible. And he brought with him a um, first edition copy of the Pilgrim's Progress, a first edition's copy of King James Bibles and all these other different books and Bibles, and it was just such a blessing. If you want to see that video, you can go to our YouTube page. I'm going to put the link into the chat room. Uh, if you haven't seen this video, it's only about an hour and a half long. I promise that it would be a blessing to you to watch this video, but... 
when he brought those Bibles to our bookstore, I met him shortly after we opened up the bookstore back in 2021. And he just walked into the store and asked me if I had ever seen an original King James Bible. I said that no, I had never with my own eyes seen an actual King James Bible. And then he got a big smile on his face. He said, would you like to see one? I said, I would love to see a King James Bible from 1611. So he went out to his car. He came back in just a couple of minutes and he brought with him this enormous, very large, very thick King James Bible in excellent condition. And he put it on the table and he told me that I could feel free to turn the pages. And the moment that my fingers touch those pages. It dawned on me that when this book was brand new, the blood of the martyrs was still being shed, that the closing days of the Spanish Inquisition were still happening when that book was first published. And I tell you, it brought tears to my eyes. We don't think about that in our day. We don't think about people like Ridley and Cramner and Latimer and what could possibly be going through their minds that they were willing to give up their lives for the cause of the Bible, the gospel, and Jesus Christ. That's where your Bible comes from. Your King James Bible has been bathed in blood. The shed blood of Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the martyrs. Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and come follow me. Whoever seeks to save his life shall lose it, and whoever seeks to lose his life for my sake shall find it unto life eternal. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. So what happens in November if Kamala Harris, who we affectionately call Comrade Kamala, what happens if America becomes truly a socialist, fascist, communist nation. The first people that are going to go are the Christians. The first book that's going to go in the garbage, the first book that's going to be put on the bonfire is going to be the Bible. Have you stopped to consider what life in America would be like if those things happen? And what would you do? Would you travel to Washington, D.C.? Would you be part of an overthrow of the government? Well, you could do that. But you wouldn't be like the apostles if you did that. Because they had every reason and every opportunity to stage an uprising and a rebellion against the government of Rome and they never did it. Paul said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. If you're a Christian, and if you're saved, God has a call on your life to use the times of tribulation and persecution. I'm not talking about the great tribulation. The church is not going to be here for the Great Tribulation. We are going to be removed in something uh, that we call the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And I know how close that we are to it because I see so many Christians trying to steal it from me. That's how I know how close we are 
to the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We are very, very close. But the question is, when the persecution comes before the rapture takes place, and there's nothing in the Bible that tells you that persecution won't return to the global church. You still have it in some South American countries. It is very present in places like North Korea, China, Russia. But what would happen if persecution came to America? How would you handle it? How would you react to it? Well, let's let the Apostle Paul have the last word on that topic. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 21 through 24. Galatians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Paul says, Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which had persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which he once destroyed. And they glorified God in me. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says this, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." and doctrine. Verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul says, Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul doesn't say, Go attack the government. And in fact, in Romans chapter 13, he says the opposite. Jonah has a question. She says, when a saved person dies and goes to heaven, how are they different when the dead in Christ are raised at the start of the rapture? So the question is, you have a saved person who dies, like Rob Beatty or Elwood France, or Anna Duffy Shank, or Glenda Fior, or Mark Bennett, if you have a saved person that dies, they go to heaven, how are they different when the dead in Christ are raised at the start of the rapture? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look down in verse 50. Now, 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So, when a believer dies and they go to heaven, they are in their soul existence up in heaven. They have a body, but it's a spiritual body. It's not a glorified body. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 
Now turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's answer Jonah's question. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, when a saved person dies, their soul and their spirit go to heaven but their body is not resurrected until the rapture of the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Um, so that's what happens to the saved believer like Rob Beatty and Anna and Glenda and Elwood. They're up there in heaven in their soul existence, and at the rapture, they're going to get their glorified body. Uh, Shannon said, Please pray for a young man that was sitting on a park bench, strung out. I feel the Lord prompted me to hand him a chick track. His eyes were closed, so I placed it on the bench and said, Here is some good news. He thanked me. Um, so please pray for the young man that Shannon gave the track to, that it may penetrate his drug-addled brain. Um, and that's what we're called to do, to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. And with that... We have come to the end of our time for tonight. I thank you so much, as always, for being a part of the NTEB global family of Bible believers across America and around the world. Lord willing, we're going to see you back here tomorrow at noon Eastern time uh, for a very intense Prophecy News podcast entitled Kamala, uh, Comrade Kamala and the dark, demonic agenda of the Democrat Party. Uh, have a great night, everybody, and Lord willing, we'll see you tomorrow. The preachers are weary, the singers are tired the church as we know it is losing its fire and some are discouraged from bearing the load but we must determine to keep pressing on cause it just one Singers go sing, and laymen keep sharing that Jesus is King. The angels have gathered, they're surrounding the throne, and they'll start rejoicing for just one more soul, causing just one more soul.